Good morning. I'm Mary Kay Fausch, and welcome you today to First Congregational Church. Please stand if you are able, and we will join together in the call to worship. Oh, that's true. The choir is going to sing first, and actually welcome us also. <laughs> sanctuary of your dwelling place, O God. Our hearts and our very substance rejoice in the living God. We have found a home in your presence. Strength and love are revealed to those whose hearts are set on the highway of the living God. From everlasting to everlasting, this is our God, the Holy One. Let us come now before God with thanksgiving and praise.
God's peace between us. Well, good morning again, and welcome to worship here at First Congregational United Church of Christ on this most beautiful October morning. We have one more to go in this month, and we're keeping our fingers crossed. It is a lovely morning, and uh, the farmers are hoping that this weather continues as well as harvest is just going great guns out there in the field. Um, this morning, I would invite you to have a look at this, locate the red welcome pad that's at the end of your row, and if you would please uh, sign your name there and let us know that you're here with us this morning. There is also a couple of areas if there's some need that you might have to be in communication with us here at the church, that that is an um, opportunity to let us know that as well. So thank you for doing that. Um, I want to uh, say thank you very much to uh, Ken Mass, who comes to us from Freeman, and his wife Mary is here with him today um, um, at the organ and leading us in our hymn singing and other music throughout our service. And uh, we know that uh, coming from Freeman has an awful lot of uh, uh, expectation for people to have music ability. So thank you very much for coming and being with us. Uh, the flowers that are placed here um, are uh, placed there by Mary Shield, given in memory of her husband Tom, and we are very grateful. They're beautiful, Mary, so thank you so much for sharing those with us. Let us take a couple of moments and have a look at our announcements that are found on page 6 and 7. And uh, we're not going to go through all of them because there are many. I'm encouraging you to please take time to look through and read, uh, finding out dates and times of the different activities and events that are taking place here. And uh, there are many, so um, thank you for the way in which you help all of us um, to be church in this particular place. One thing that I do want to uh, mention is that um, you, tomorrow is the Eugene Field Lunch that we're providing for their teachers and staff, it's an in-service and conference day. We are in partnership with um, Eugene Field School, and that is one way we can show our appreciation for the work that they do in educating children. So um, within here, you kind of get a sense of when you need to, that when you need to have things here, um, and there was something that I neglected, and I don't know why I did, because I love dessert. So how could I forget that we have not included any cookies or bars? So if any of you um, are able between now and 10 o'clock tomorrow morning to make a few dozen or a couple dozen cookies or a pan of bars, just mark your container if you want to return, bring it to the church office by 10 o'clock, and we'll make sure that it is delivered and enjoyed. So thank you. Just let me know on after worship. And after worship today, we have our new members brunch. Um, so we're very excited about that, and next week we will um, be receiving new members during um, perhaps both of the um, worship services uh, next Sunday morning. So thank you, and we are uh, looking forward to that. Um, I, are there any other announcements that need to be made? Yes, Dr. Daniel.
Thank you. And we will continue to hold you and your entire family in our prayers. Uh, Pastor Daniel uh, will be um, traveling with his mother um, to Africa um, for the funeral service um, of his father, um, who will be buried there in, um, in your homeland. Yes, we will remember you. Thank you. And then I would ask uh, Pastor Ryan if he would share some additional uh, prayer uh, updates. Uh, before we move into the prayer concerns, I would like to invite Diane DeCoyer forward. I understand that she has a special announcement. Okay, and then Chad. Yes, come on up. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Chad Colm, and uh, I have been asked by the stewardship committee of the resource team to... Uh, share a few thoughts on giving and why we give. And uh, so one day at uh, church here, Jack Marshman came up and asked uh, if I would speak on this subject. And so I went home and I told Erica, I said, hey, Jack uh, asked me to speak in front of the congregation. And she said, oh yeah, uh, what about? And I said, why we give? And so she half jokingly said, guilt. Uh, <laughs> which, by the way, is, is uh, pretty much what I was thinking. Um, and so, uh, Ryan, don't worry, we're not fighting the urges of a, you know, a Catholic conversion or anything. Um, but with that in mind, I've put some thought into uh, this subject and guilt, or perhaps a better word is, is obligation. And, you know, so why do, why do I feel that way? And, and uh, I came up with three kind of big areas of belief that I have that, that shape this. And, and the first is uh, family. And for me, uh, family is the most important thing. And um, part of that is, uh, I guess I'd like to just take a moment and, and look around here. And, uh, you know, what do you see? Because uh, I see... When, when we come on Sundays, you know, I see familiar faces. I see uh, people that are like me and others that aren't like me very much. Um, you know, some that are older, some, some that are younger. Uh, but uh, I consider this my church family. And so Mike's got a scared look in his eyes right now. And remember, you can pick your friends, but not your family. Uh, and we live here. We, we live in this building, so I consider uh, this my church family uh, and my church house, and, and, and through that, then I feel obligated to give and take care of the family and the house, I guess. Um, so that's the first thing. The, the second thing is, um, and I know many of you have heard this time and time again, but uh, I, I believe, I do uh, truly believe that uh, for a church to be healthy and, and, and thriving and, and successful, the church needs three things from its members, and that's time, uh, talents, and treasure, right? And so uh, time, we, we need to attend worship. Uh, you know, a church without people worshiping isn't a, isn't a church. Uh, talents, it's my opinion that we need to volunteer uh, and share uh, our talents, our skills, and passion to keep the church healthy and strong. And then finally, treasure, uh, money. The church needs money to take care of the house and fulfill the missions uh, that, that we have. And so that's kind of the second thing, of, you know, the, the obligation of, of uh, taking you know, my belief that the church needs our, our treasure, our money. And then, uh, so finally, uh, I, I am of the opinion that uh, everything we have is a gift from God. And... Uh, that begins, for me, with uh, you know, a recognition of our mental capabilities, uh, you know, of our physical abilities and skills. Um, I believe that those are all gifts from God. And so, for me, the next logical step is that that means that all of our earnings and our money is therefore also God's or a gift from God. And so, on the guilt or obligation side, I guess, uh, it seems... Uh, only normal that we would return, and my opinion is that we should return a portion of that which was given to us in the form of an offering. Again, something you've, you've, you've probably already heard. 
Um, and so those three things, the fact that, you know, I feel that this is my church family and I need to take care of it, uh, the, the belief that the, the church needs my money, and, and finally that I'm returning a portion of what God gave to me in the first place are the, those three things. And so um, each year, uh, at this time of year, the stewardship committee does our big campaign, and you've probably already got your pledge card. I know we did in the mail. Um, and so if you share any of those beliefs or if that helps you know, trigger a thought to you to give, I would encourage you to, to fill that card out. Um, I think it's a win-win. You can help the church continue to be vibrant, strong, and growing. Um, and then at the personal level, perhaps, you'll feel a little less guilty or you'll feel that your uh, obligation is fulfilled. Thanks. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Chad. I would invite you to take a look uh, now at our prayer list, which is on the bottom of page four in your bulletin. And uh, we, we include, uh, you know, the full list of names there each week, all of those for whom we, we keep close in our prayers throughout the week. And then you'll notice that we lift up uh, specific names in bold print. Those are those who uh, are either new to the list this week or we have specific updates and specific requests for those prayers. And so those are, those, uh, those are the names in which, which we uh, lift up aloud in our community prayers. So a couple of updates we'd like to offer today. Uh, we do offer our prayers for the, all of the loved ones of Barbara White. Uh, Barbara died last week, and we held the service celebration of her life on Tuesday. And uh, without many uh, close family, you all really were Barbara's church family. Uh, throughout much of her life. She was a, uh, baptized here in 1921 and a church member since she was confirmed in 1936. So an 80-year church member and we continue to uh, celebrate her life and invite your prayers for all of those loved ones of Barbara. Uh, we also learned of the death of Marge Silvis' son-in-law, John Thompson. Uh, John struggled with ALS for some time and uh, he died earlier this week. So invite your prayers for Marge and others. Um, and then we continue our prayers uh, or excuse me, we, we offer uh, new prayers this week for Janelle Bach. She had a brief hospitalization, uh, routine procedure, everything is going very well, uh, but a few weeks of recovery, so invite your prayers for Janelle also. We add to this list uh, also uh, Lillian Kiyungu's uh, family. Lillian's brother Emmanuel uh, died suddenly, uh, very unexpected, so invite your uh, thoughts and prayers for Lillian and, and her family as well. Are there others you'd like to add to our list today? Was name allowed. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Let us continue now on our worship as we join together in our prayer of confession. So let us pray together. Merciful God, we live in a world which is saved by the foolishness of men and women just like. So we pray for your healing power of a humble spirit. Wherever voices trumpet their greatness and images boast of their beauty, wherever power is flaunted and wealth is squandered, wherever there is disdain and the sacred value of creatures and earth are denied, and wherever the gifts of difference and dignity are rejected, Forgive us and remind us of our own brokenness and need. Teach us to serve and to treat everyone with the same grace and love you show toward us. Let us now pause for a moment of silence in offering our own personal reflection. My friends, our God specializes in the redemption and restoration of humankind. With joy and gentleness, God draws us close, and, the gift, and in the gift of God's forgiveness, we find our freedom. Thanks be to God. Amen.
This is the scripture for today from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make their place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion, O Lord of God of hosts. Hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look at the face of your anointed. For the day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. And now we hear another parable coming from the Gospel of Luke. What you see in your bulletin, though, says verses 1 through 8. It is actually verses 9 through 14, but the words that are printed there are correct. So if you go back to check up on me later, I want to just make sure you have the right ones. So let us now hear another challenging teaching from Jesus. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded <clears throat> others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray. 
one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. May God's grace and love be revealed fresh and new in the reading, in the hearing, and in the living of this holy word. Amen. <clears throat> There's a story of a lovely lady. Oh, you know that one. Really, we're not going that direction to hear about the mother with three lovely girls from the Brady Bunch. But today, we are going to hear a story of another wonderful, lovely lady who grew up in the mountains of Colorado at Cripple Creek, near the El Paso gold mine, about an hour's drive west from the city limits of Denver. Joan relished telling the stories and showing the treasures of her childhood to every new person who entered her South Dakota home. There was the picture hanging on the wall of the entrance to one of the gold mines. There were eye-catching stone specimens identified and labeled, along with a few pieces of gold she'd found on her own, displayed beneath the glass top of her coffee table. That table was a focal point in her living room, which made it easy to relive the hikes with her mother as they had explored the mountainside. It was fascinating to listen to her recollections of a place so very different from growing up on the plains. She was well acquainted with a kind of life balance that is unfamiliar to us. She saw firsthand the beauty of mountain living and learned at an early age to recognize it as a lovely dwelling place. She also knew of the perils that existed if a child were to enter a mine shaft, that the many loose rocks along the paths could easily cause a person to slip and fall and receive serious injury, and to be really careful of those drunken, biting burrows belonging to the miners who let them wander around all over during the day or during the late afternoon and evening foraging for food. But she was fearless in propelling down a rocky hillside on a shovel, an interesting variation of sledding to say the least. To me, she was a real rock star. The experiences she shared were riveting. Joan loved that place so much and received such strength from it that when she married, it was jokingly said that her wedding vows to the groom, her husband for 50 years, went like this. I, Joan, promise to marry you, Fred, and live on the flatlands of South Dakota as long as you, Fred, promise to accept that I, Joan, will make a trip back to my Colorado Rocky Mountain home each year as long as we both shall live. Well, Fred made that promise. He made that promise to her, and it helped her happily spend her life with him in South Dakota. Her yearly pilgrimage up the mountain to Cripple Creek renewed her spirit. 
Everyone who knew her saw it. Her eyes would sparkle and shine as she convincingly testified to everyone who would listen about how it felt each time she returned to that place, which was both heaven and earth to her. When she came back to South Dakota, she was a mountain of strength for everyone and everything she did for her family, for her church, for her community. On one of my visits to see family in Denver, I decided I had to see this place for myself. It was amazingly clear why Cripple Creek was such a special memory for my friend. There is just something about going up to a higher level that helps people feel closer to God. Do you remember thinking kind of like that? The first time you ever flew on an airplane and you're, or hearing the words of children who were on a plane for the first time saying to their parents, am I gonna see God? And how sometimes you'd peer out and you're just like straining your eyes, just hoping, hoping to catch a glimpse of God in that higher place. Well, perhaps we do, perhaps we have and we just have yet to realize it. In Old Testament days, the Hebrew people actually believed that the higher up you were, the nearer you were to your creator. This idea has continued through the centuries as God's people erected their places of prayer and worship on elevated ground, building them tall and grand that there might be no doubt of its importance in the lives of the people who saw it or went up the mountainside or hillside or even long flights of steps to enter there. Such is true of the many great cathedrals, mosques, and temples of the world, not dependent upon Christianity alone, but the truth is there for any number of world traditions. All we have to do is look around where we live to see this. Whether it be in our, in our agricultural lands dotted with white houses of worship, adorned with bell towers or cross-topped spires that rise up out of the golden fields waiting to be harvested, or here in Sioux Falls with numerous brick and stone church structures, well-positioned and remarkable, in their construction that leads our eyes heavenward. Something similar is true within those buildings as well. Sitting here this morning, we experience the grandness of a perspective of height of the domed space that is above us. For those who are seated on the main floor anyway, then there is the expansive balcony with a divine window that overlooks the entire balcony and sanctuary. Along with the towering panels of stained glass windows that are on either side of us, as the small brochure, and I have a copy of it in case you want to read more about it that's in the holders in your pew, talking about these memorial windows, there is a statement about them that is ever so true, that these windows were created to produce a musical flow of color. They are meant to enhance our experience of God's presence with us, which are providing that in all fullness this morning and the color of the spectrum that is shining in upon us and even in your face is sitting there in the choir. So Chad, thank you for mentioning the beauty of the building, for that is certainly one of the things that matters here in this place. This is indeed a lovely dwelling place. And then here in Jesus' parable in Luke are two men going up to the temple to pray, going up. 
each of them for a very different reason, but both of them recognizing it was a place they needed to be. Our temptation in hearing, in hearing this scripture is to focus on the extremes of their prayers, to find what seems to be a more righteous and acceptable attitude in presenting themselves before God as one justifies himself and the other struggles, barely able to believe he was worthy of being justified at all. But I would challenge us to see that the most important factor in this parable is that they did in fact go up. They went up to the temple. You see, this physical ascent of a few or many steps or the inclusiveness of an accessible ramp into the church is also a spiritual ascent as well. Each time we enter, a pilgrimage is taken, for this is the place where visible actions become the means of grace whether it is when we gather for the meal around the, the table, sharing in communion together, or we sit or stand in witness of those who are baptized or confirmed or dedications that take place, each one of those are visible means of God's grace. And the revelation of God's presence becomes very real to us in this lovely dwelling where we belong, where we are welcome, where we are loved in spite of ourselves. At the end of this parable, both men go back down to their homes, counted as righteous before God. The Pharisee will leave the temple and return to his home righteous. This hasn't changed because he was righteous when he came up and he is righteous as he goes back down. The tax collector, however, will leave the temple and go back down to his home counted as righteous too. And why? Because in this place, in that place, that is God's holy ordinance. God's holy ordinance of forgiveness and love. My friends, we are called to accept this pilgrimage journey to go up to worship and pray. When this happens, and if we can forget, if only for a moment, our human formed divisions and stand be before God aware only of our need, then we too are justified. The renewal of strength received here goes with us in our coming down from the mountain and stepping back into daily life, claiming the good news that our destination, daily and eternal, lies with God. This is, my friends, the, con the message that contains the transforming power by which we profess to find strength, value, and the very essence of life. May that be so. Amen. And may we all say together, Amen.
I invite you to join with me now in a time that we offer our prayers for one another, for the community around us, and for our whole world. We'll close together with the Lord's Prayer as it is printed. And I would invite you to join with me first now in a time of silence. Let us be attentive to God's Spirit here in this place, in this lovely dwelling place of God, that we might let our prayers arise here in this space. Let us pray. We thank you, God of love and life, for all the ways that you are present to us in this congregation and in our daily life. At this time of year, we thank you for the symbolic reminders of your creative power around us. The leaves changing color, the coolness of evening, the hastening darkness of night. Yet even in the rhythm of the seasons, your love and faithfulness remain constant. We pray that we would be strengthened and enlivened by your steadfast spirit working at the very heart of our church's life. We pray for the world you loved so much that you made your home among us. We pray especially today for those who yearn for peace and freedom and justice in their own land and in their own lifetime. We remember all who continue to find themselves caught up in conflicts beyond their control beyond even their understanding. And we pray for members of our own armed forces serving in dangerous and difficult places. We remember those closer to home, some of them part of our own circle of family and friends and neighbors who suffer at this time, those who suffer from loss and grief, from anxiety and worry, from mental or physical illness, from the despair of loneliness and fear. We pray you would surround all who are fighting cancer in their bodies and those who live with illness that has no cure. Today we remember many on our hearts and we especially lift up and name aloud today, Pastor Daniel and his mother, Lillian Kyungu's family and all who loved Emmanuel the family and friends of John Thompson, the loved ones of Barbara White, the family and friends of Carol Hennessy, Janelle Fillingsness Bach, the family of Lorraine Springer. We pray for Judy, Mary, Elaine, Arliss, Michael, for Betty Natz, for the family and friends of Leona Gall, the family and friends of Margie Abbott, and for Bob Harrison. For all these, we pray, God of mercy, that you would be their light in darkness, their comfort in their struggle, their strength, even when they think they cannot carry on. Encircle them with your grace and protection, we pray, that they may know they are never alone in their struggle. O God, we are conscious that you have set before us the great hope that your kingdom will be made real on earth. Lead us now in love and in hope to pray and to work for that day when all shall be one in Jesus Christ, the one who taught his followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we respond with our gifts, that we might join together in this ongoing ministry to live out God's vision for the world as we see it, a way of living out a thinking faith, an unbounded welcome, generous service, and the creative ways in which we worship each and every day. We invite you to consider a gift uh, today and also to include in your God's Hands card ways in which you, you uh, desire to offer your prayers, your talents, and your presence throughout the coming week. We invite you to offer those gifts at the basket that will be at the front here in just a moment. 
or you can remain seated and an usher will come to you to receive your offering today. Let us give joyfully and generously this morning.
gracious demeanor, and a peaceful heart. May God fill you with all peace, that you may abound in hope, assured that your prayers are heard by a loving and gracious Creator. And as we go, go now in the abundant love of God, the empowering grace of Christ, and the strengthening presence of the Holy Spirit, now 